Okay, this lecture is on chapter 15, on special senses, and we'll hit some of the highlights and hopefully let you know what you need to know for the upcoming test. Okay, to start with, we're going to look at some of you. Your eyebrow is there to stop the sweat and rain from getting in your eyes. Eyelashes, similar function, also help keep bugs, insects, and things out of your eyes. Okay, this is the palpebra, also an eyelid, the upper and lower palpebra here. The lateral commissure here, and this is a medial commissure here. Lacrimal caruncle is the little bump you see right there on your eye. The sclera is the white of your eye, and it's covered with conjunctiva. The red is the conjunctiva. This uh, the cornea is invisible, and what you're seeing under here is the iris, and then the pupil is actually a hole in the iris, and the reason it appears black is because no light is coming into it. And we'll go from there. Let's see. Okay, these are some pictures of some of the muscles. This is the levator palpebra superioris here, and it is considered to be one of the most one of the weakest muscles in the body so if you're if you get tired and your eyelids start drooping you can blame it on that you can see your cornea and then this is the bulbar conjunctiva is over the cornea and then you have a conjunctival sac it would be red if it were a better picture conjunctiva is transparent and uh, the bulbar conjunctiva covers a white of the eyes and produces a lubricating mucus secretion. And if your eyes are bloodshot, it's the vascularity in this conjunctiva that you're seeing. The lacrimal apparatus, this is tears, the tear apparatus. Tears are made up of dilute saline with mucus, some antibodies, and lysosome. Probably more than 20% of you, if you do a culture from the, your conjunctiva, would get any growth at all because as the eyes water and spread this, uh, an these antibodies and lysosome, it does a pretty good job of keeping the germs from growing in your conjunctiva. Where you get into trouble is if you're exposed to someone with a really bad germ or if you leave contacts in too long or swim in water with contacts. But let's just look at the picture on drainage. Okay, this, of course, it would be internal, but this is your lacrimal gland and it produces tears. And these are the little tear ducts here. And the tears go across the eye when you blink and they're picked up in this lacrimal punctus. And these little things here are lacrimal canuliculus, well, two canuliculi. And this is the nasolacrimal duct. So it goes from your eye down into your nose. So the inferior meatus of the nose. So if you're in lab and something burns your nose, your eyes will start watering because the excess tears, I mean, so your nose will start running because excess tears are going to come out of your nose and wherever they go. Okay, these are some of the muscles. The superior oblique muscle right here. Uh, superior rectus muscle here. If you notice, uh, well, we'll see a better picture of the superior oblique. You have a this tendon goes up over this little trochlear notch here. This is a lateral rectus muscle, inferior oblique, and inferior rectus muscle here. And they all come together, and we've got a better picture in a minute, and tendinous ring here, but they just didn't picture it. I mean, we didn't have that common tendinous ring. We did not have that in our dissection specimens because they didn't go back far enough. So all the muscles, and the nerves, as well as your optic nerve, are surrounded by this tendinous structure. 
Okay, here is what I was trying to show you this or talk to you about. Superior oblique muscle actually goes from here and goes across this trochlea, a little loop. So it's almost like a pulley system. So when this muscle contracts, the eye rotates this way, which is pretty cool the uh, way it's made. Okay, you all should be very familiar with this picture, but I'm going to run through it just briefly for sclera. I'll use just the hand. The retina is uh, represented here as uh, red stuff. The choroid is, I, I, I meant the yellow stuff. Retina is yellow stuff. The choroid is the red stuff. It's the vascularity. And in your dissection specimens, it appeared to be black. But if you look in the back of the eye, you'll see that it's actually red in a living specimen. This is vitreous humor. It's in the posterior segment. Now we have two segments, the posterior segment filled with vitreous humor and the anterior segment, which contains aqueous humor. Now the anterior segment is basically, I'm going to draw a line through here, is this half and the posterior is this half. So forward is the anterior segment. And in the anterior segment, we have chambers. And I'm trying to see if they're pictured here. Um, yeah, here they are. The anterior uh, segment of the anterior chamber here, and the posterior segment anterior chamber is right in this area. Now, they contain aqueous humor, and it drains through this scleral venous sinus. If you get a buildup, of this drainage, uh, if, you, if this little hole stops up, the eye will fill with too much fluid and you'll have glaucoma. This is ciliary zonule, ciliary bodies, and this is your lens. This is the one that bounces, and it focuses light on the back of the retina. Now, this is a blind spot because this is where your optic nerve comes in. Uh, we got better pictures to show some of the other parts of the back of the eye. Uh, this is the outer part is dense avascular connective tissues and cornea. Sclera white, cornea transparent. The vascular layer is also called the uvea. So if you hear of someone having uveitis, this is what they've got inflamed. Uh, a uh, middle pigmented layer is choroid, ciliary body, and iris. And the choroid region supplies blood. Ciliary body is a ring surrounding the lens, and the iris is a colored part of your eye. It may be blue, brown, gray, light brown, green, uh, dark brown, whatever. The pupil is the opening. Okay, how the eyes, you've got two sets of muscles for dilation and uh, con constriction. So the sphincter pupillae contracts, it's a circular muscle here, and this is under parasympathetic control, and it causes the pupil to constrict. Now, when you get sympathetic stimulation, the dilator pupillae actually pulls out and causes the eye to dilate. Okay, the retina, delicate two-layered membrane, pigmented layer, which is outer, that absorbs light and prevents it scattering, stores vitamin A. The neural layer has the actual photoreceptors that transduce light energy. That means they take light energy and turn it into a signal. They actually gather that light and use it as a receptor, basically. And we have bipolar neurons that actually take light on the receptor side and then send it on down back towards the brain. Here's your neural layer. You have the pigmented layer here, and I don't have a hand. This is the neural layer here and the pigmented layer here and the optic disc has got to be a blind spot because there's no receptors there. 
because you have your optic nerve coming out the back. And I just said that optic disc is a blind spot. Okay, photoreceptors, you've known this forever, the general terms. Rods operate in dim light and they're non-color, so it's black and white, gray, and they're not as clear, they're fuzzy, indistinct. And the reason for this is because they share pathways. They're, they don't have each receptor doesn't go to a specific exact spot, so it's not as clear. Uh, it's good for peripheral uh, vision. It's good for when you're in a dark room, once your eyes adjust to it. Cones, uh, they're concentrated in the macula, lutea, and fovea centralis. They operate in bright light and they get high acuity color vision. Acuity because that means uh, real sharp, clear. And that's because you have an individual uh, receptor is going to have its own path. So we'll call this receptor, we'll call this the brain. And of course, we're going to the back of the brain. And it's going to go in here through cranial nerve two, and then through the lateral geniculate body and around here back to the back of the brain. How y'all like my drawing in there? Wonderful. Okay. Now, blood supply to the retina. Two sources. The choroid is the outer third and photoreceptors. And then we have a central artery and vein that supplies the inner two thirds. And this is a really cool view because you're actually looking into the eye with an ophthalmoscope. You can see the density here in the macula lutea. The optic disc is an area that lacks photoreceptors. Now, these arteries and veins coming out of this area, they're coming in through the same channel that the optic disc is coming from here. And um, they're supplying uh, vascularity to the eye. It's interesting, not only does the ophthalmologist or optometrist look inside your eye just to be sure you don't have cataracts or that nothing is horrible wrong, they also can look at your vessels. And if you have obstructions in these vessels, it could mean that you'll have obstructions in other places. So it can help indicate heart attack, stroke impending. And they're working on optimizing the tests, the, the cameras that can look in the eye to actually make this more clear. Okay, internal chamber, the lens and ciliary zonule separates the anterior and posterior segments. So here we have lens and ciliary zonule right here. So this is the posterior segment. This is the anterior segment. And I actually got ahead of myself and mentioned this, but we might as well mention it anyway. Posterior segment contains vitreous humor. It transmits light. It supports the surface of the lens. It holds the retina firmly against the pigmented layer. Helps keep the intraocular pressure up to normal. Now, if people become older, this is a more delicate thing, and they're more apt to have retinal detachment. Also, boxers, people who get head injuries, tend to get retinal detachment. And if you suspect a patient has retinal detachment on the phone, this is a four-star emergency. You need to get them in uh, yesterday would be better than today. Uh, immediately, because a retinal detachment that's caught now and treated within two or three hours can be fixable. A retinal detachment that you put off for two weeks causes permanent blindness in that eye. And we're talking about seniors in a lot of cases. And if they don't have vision in both eyes, they lose depth perception, which is in, increases their fall risk. And if they fall, they're likely to break something. And if they break something, when we're talking about our 80 plus crowd, 70% of these elderly people who break their hip are going to end up dead within a year. So if you think you have a possibility of a detached retina, uh, it's 
you know, get an ambulance. Okay, the anterior segment. Okay, posterior segments, vitreous humor. Anterior segment has aqueous humor. Anterior chamber of the anterior segment is between the cornea and the iris. Posterior chamber of the anterior segment is between the iris and the lens. Okay, this anterior segment contains aqueous humor. Similar to plasma, it's filtered from capillaries of the ciliary processes. It drains from the scleral venous sinus, also known as canal of Schlin, and it's right where the sclera and cornea come together. Um, supplies nutrients and oxygen to the limb and the cornea and the retina and removes waste. And glaucoma is because you have blockage of the drainage of aqueous humor. And this is treated with drops of pilocarpine. It doesn't take uh, but 45 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour of extremely high pressure in an eye to cause permanent blindness. So if you've got a patient that needs eye drops five times a day, put those eye drops in your patient five times a day. The lens actually allows precise focusing of light on the retina so that you can get a clear vision. Now cataracts are cl indicate, cl or they are cloud, it is clouding of the lens. Causes of it, <laughs> living too, aging, diabetes mellitus, heavy smoking, intense sunlight, and probably evil spirits. Who knows? Some cataracts, people don't know why people have them. And this is looking in an eye. That's actually the light source right here. But this lens you can't see through. And you can't see in and they can't see out. So that lens will be surgically removed and replaced with another lens. And then there'll be a See, probably better than they did before the cataract. Okay, our eyes respond to visible light, which is a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, light travels in energy packets called photons, and they, a photon uh, or a quanta of light travels in a wave-like fashion. So light actually is very similar to matter in that it is little particles and it bends, it responds to gravity and it changes course, it can be reflected off of things, but it also is considered to be pure energy. So I'll let you go ahead and figure that one out. Uh, all you need to do is just get a PhD in quantum physics and you'll have it made. Okay, I think I'll pass on doing that myself. Rods and cones respond to a different spectrum of the uh, wavelengths of light. Okay, here we have a little thing showing. Okay, these are all electromagnetic magnetic radiation, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet light. Visible light is just a small portion. Infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. And I think everybody knows about light rays being concentrated to make a laser. Radio waves are concentrated and used to cook tissue in humans, and disease tissue. Um, certain cancers, they can also, they're used in ablations of aberrant nodes in the heart that are causing arrhythmias. Okay, here's cones that respond to blue light here. Here's cones that respond to green light, and then red cones. And this is showing some of the spectrums they can respond to. And these are rods, and you pretty much just see in black and white when those are stimulated. But the way it works is if you have uh, light, many, many colors coming in, uh, you know, purple, green, the, if it's, say, purple, you're going to stimulate blue and red at the same time, and you mix them up to see purple. Now, some animals, particularly insects, can see UV light, possibly red light, so they see things beyond anything we would ever imagine, and, um, 
the it's possible that some other animals do as well. Whole industry is based on the assumption that deer actually see. It's turned on me. That deer see UV radiation because they sell anti UV radiation uh, laundry detergent, wash for people, anti UV radiation uh, clothing because it's assumed that deer can see it. They may, they may not, but somebody's making a lot of money on the assumption. Now, refraction is bending the light. Light changes speed when it passes from one media, through one medium to another. And when light meets the surface of a medium at a different or at an oblique angle, it actually bends. And this happens is how our lens actually shapes light. Convex lens, like in the eye, is bent so that the rays converge on a single point. So here's your lens, light coming in this way. And without that lens focusing, this could be the back of our retina, it would just scatter everywhere. I'll use this, scatter everywhere, and you couldn't focus. But this lens changes its shape and causes that light to focus clearly on one particular spot in the eye. Oh, and I forgot to mention, it's upside down and backwards. You have to reverse it in your brain. Okay, and rods uh, respond to very dim light. It's only in gray tones. You get fuzzy, indistinct images. Cones need bright light, and they have color vision. And the pathways are non-converging, so you get high-resolution vision. If you want to know what high-resolution means, think about a picture that's highly pixelated versus one that's clear and sharp, taken with a uh, camera, like a cheap camera versus a good camera. The one that's pixelated would be low-resolution. You can't tell what it is. High-resolution. It's a clear picture. You can see it clearly. Depth perception, you get vision coming in from both eyes and uh, from slightly different angles. And your brain puts those two pictures together and causes you to see three-dimensionally. Okay, next we have our chemical senses. Taste and smell. Smell is also called olfaction. And chemoreceptors respond to chemicals in aqueous solution. That's why if you eat a bunch of crackers or your mouth is dry, you can't taste your food. You have to have that liquid. Okay, sense of smell, uh, of course your nose, you actually have olfactory epithelium in the roof of the nasal cavity and olfactory receptor cells are actual bipolar neurons with radiating cilia. Uh, they take axons from these receptor cells and uh, form the filaments of cranial nerve one. Now, this is a disproportionate picture, but it gives you the idea. Uh, molecules of scent come through with breathing. They rotate around these turbinates and there would be thousands of these little receptors, so this is disproportionate. But they pick up uh, odorant, just one chemical binds to, uh, I got it on the next page, the dissolved odorant binds to a receptor and uh, that causes uh, a G protein mechanism that's activated that produces cyclic, cyclic AMP, which opens sodium and calcium channels, causes depolarization and an action potential. So it's an action potential that's caused by these odorants binding to receptors. And there are many, many uh, thousands of type odorants. And it depends on the species. Humans have to have more molecules of odorant to know what smells than a dog does, for instance. They can learn so much about their environment just from smell. They know neighbor dogs been in their yard. They know what kids have come over and who picked up their toy? They can tell that because they can pick up even one molecule of scent. So the little uh, 
cilia receptors. These are the olfactory receptor cells. They go up into here, and these uh, output cells go into the olfactory tract. Okay, the sense of taste is very similar, but the receptor cells are taste buds, as you probably already knew. They're found on the tongue, on fungiform papillae, on the outside walls of folate and circumvallate papillae. And here we have our pictures. Folate papillae here on the sides. Fungiform papillae are little bumps on your tongue. And these are circumvallate papillae here. Now they're flask shaped, so let's draw a little flask here. Uh, that's, I'll draw, they don't really have, you know, a handle and look like a wine cup, but these are made up of 50 year plus little epithelial cells. It's starting to look like SpongeBob, that's not my intention. Okay, these, you have basal cells and taste cells. Now microvilli from the gustatory cells actually project through a pore. So they're sticking up through the pore. And this is the gustatory cell. And uh, the odorant will be attached to this. And it will pick up and stimulate whatever flavor it has and send it down and cause an action potential. Okay, five basic taste sensations, sweet, which is going to be sugar, saccharin, other artificial sweeteners, alcohol, certain amino acids, sour is from hydrogen ions, salt, metal ions, bitter, alkaloids, quinine, nicotine, and many toxins, and umami is certain amino acids, aspartate, and Glutamate, so monosodium glutamate is a commonly used flavor enhancer. Umami is a supposed to be a very rich, savory taste, and it's a Japanese word that means yummy, beefy, or in other translations, savory, yum. Okay, to be tasted, a chemical has to be first dissolved in saliva and then contact the gustatory hairs. Remember, we have our little cup, and then we have the little hair going up through there. Taste. And it depolarizes the taste cell membrane, neurotransmitters released, action potential. That's the action potential there. Negative, 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 and so on goes back into your brain where it's uh, recognized as a particular taste. Taste is also 80% smell. Um, if you stop up your nose, you can't taste your food as well. And uh, if food smells rank or nasty, it tastes rank or nasty. Okay, thermoreceptors, tell you how hot it is. We like our soup hot and our ice cream cold. Mechanoreceptors tell us the texture, and no one can stand the thought of soggy potato chips. And you know, we've got we like our foods to have certain textures. Nociceptors are actually uh, for pain. So when we get the burn of Mexican food, hot salsa that's so delicious that we all like. I think there's other you know, Indian foods. There's other foods that are hot. For that matter, some barbecue sauces are really hot. But those of us who like that taste, we have learned that we're going to get a big old endorphin rush. And so the flavor is just delicious. And it's actually pain in our mouth is changing it, the taste. So temperature and texture either enhance or detract from taste. Okay, the ear, hearing and balance. Now, the ear has the external ear, middle ear, or tympanic cavity, and the internal ear. Internal and internal and middle ear are for hearing. The internal is both hearing and equilibrium. Okay, here are parts. Um, I think I'd be better off with a hand. Of course, all this is external ear. This is our external acoustic meatus. 
helix, auricle or pina, lobule, and you can get infections in the external ear. That would be otitis externa, a swimmer's ear. Here is our tympanic membrane, middle ear, and then inner ear. And the pictures are better in future things that tell us things. Okay, the tympanic membrane is the eardrum. And it's a boundary between the external and middle ears, connective tissue that vibrates in response to sound. So sound is a wave, and that wave is transferred to the tympanic membrane. And then that wave energy, it goes to the, the ossicles in the ear. This is a little off the subject. It's just the anatomical stuff, though. The pharyngotympanic tube or the auditory tube or the eustachian tube, all the same thing, is there to equalize the pressure. This is your pharyngotympanic tube. So this connects the middle ear to the pharynx. So it's in connection with germs. If this becomes stopped up because of inflammation, infection, uh, adenoids pressing on it, extremely big tonsils, if that does become infected, then what's going to happen is you're going to get otitis media, which is an infection in here. And this happens and causes, you know, horrendous pain. And it can rupture the membrane. And when they put tubes in your ears, they actually put a tube in the tympanic membrane. It's a little drainage tube. So if you go swimming and immerse that head, you're going to let water into here, which is not a good idea. You don't want water in the middle ear. These are our ossicles. I think I have a bigger picture here in a minute. Ossicles are the malleus and stapes. And let's just go to the picture. Okay, this is malleus here, which means hammer. This is the incus here, and this is the stapes, which is stirrup, and it looks like a stirrup. Also, two muscles that some people are not well aware of, the stapedius muscle, which incidentally is the smallest muscle in the body, and then the tensor tympani muscle. Now, if you have sudden loud sounds, these two muscles will spasm, and they'll pull on these ossicles and decrease the amount of sound that can be transmitted to the oval window and therefore prevent uh, nerve deafness. So that's why your ears ring or you can't hear maybe for two days after hearing loud noises is because these muscles are in a state of spasm. Okay, the internal ear. It's a low, a bony labyrinth. Now, a labyrinth is a series of tunnels or caves. Uh, think of a castle with all these secret tunnels and chambers under it. Same top thing, except it's in channels in the temporal bone. And the internal ear has three parts, the vestibule, semicircular canals, and cochlea. And they're filled with perilymph, which is actually similar to the cerebrospinal fluid that we have, you know, surrounding our brain parts. And then there's a series of membranous sacs within these, within the perilymph, and they're filled with endolymph, which is different in that it has more potassium. Okay. The vestibule, let's see if we can uh, go ahead to that just for a minute. This is our, well, I haven't got the pen here. This is a vestibule area here. And now I'm going to go back to the other slide. The vestibule has two membranous sacs in it. The saccule is continuous with a cochlear duct. The utricle is continuous with the semicircular canals, and they house equilibrium receptors. The, um, oh, let's see, I lost my train of thought. They respond to gravity and changes in position in the head. Now here we have, and we also have our semicircular canals here. They're kind of 
semicircular, see? semicircular. And as you see here, they're going in to this vestibular nerve here. Vestib vestibular is balance. Now look at this little snail type thing. This is the uh, spiral organ, organ of corti, also cochlear duct and cochlea, all this area is called that. And it goes into the cochlear nerve. Okay, sound is a pressure disturbance. Alternating areas of high and low pressure produce a vibrating object. Sound wave moves in all directions. So you see it going in a circle here, but we can represent it as a sine wave here. Up, jing, jing, jing. Now, this is the amplitude of the wave. This is the wavelength. Frequency is how many waves go by in a particular moment. So how many waves go by is extremely related to wavelength. Okay, number of waves that pass a given point in a given time is frequency. And we, we perceive this as pitch. Wavelength is the distance between two crests or two troughs. And it, of shorter wavelengths with higher frequency. Amplitude is the height of the crest. So pitch is a perception of different frequencies. The higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. The lower the frequency, the lower the pitch. Loudness is how much sound you put across there. You're getting a higher amplitude. So if you whisper, you have a low amplitude. And if you yell, you have a high amplitude. Here is, sorry, here is a low amplitude. Here is a high amplitude. Okay, here. Here we have a high frequency. Here we have a low frequency. Okay. This is showing the sound wave going through, vibrating the membrane here, the tympanic membrane, vibrating the malleus incus stapes, transmitting that sound into the oval window. And then it starts going along through here and through the cochlear ducts. And individual sounds stimulate individual little hair cells that aren't made out of hair. Now, if you look here, these are very short. These are very long. This corresponds to short, long. So a fast vibration will stimulate this receptor. You get a high pitch. A slow frequency, low frequency wave stimulates the longer receptor and you get a low pitch. Okay, and this is just a picture I probably should have pulled out, but it's showing the different cells and the nerves and fibers. And okay, auditory or hearing pathways decussate in such a way that both cortexes or cortices or parts of your cerebral cortex is what they're talking about, receive input from both ears and the impulses from specific hair cells are interpreted as pitches. Now you never are just going to get one pitch. You're going to have a many, many sounds at once and then they're put together in your brain as one sound. Loudness is the number of action potentials because you yelled louder. Localization of sound depends on relative intensity that is each year, each ear. So you could hear your left ear, your right ear, figure out how loud the sound is. Your brain calculates where that sound came from. Okay, homeostatic imbalance, conduction deadness. You can have a blocked sound conduction anywhere from the external ear all the way into the inner ear. Impacted earwax. We mentioned someone found earwax and a roach bug in an ear recently. Perforated eardrum. The ear won't function properly because the eardrum doesn't work. Uh, otosclerosis of the ossicles, you know, they're kind of arthritic, I guess you could say, looking. 
they don't work. You could also have otitis media, which is inflammation, otitis externa, if the external ear is full of pus, or if you had otitis interna, the internal ear would be full of pus. All these would cause conduction deafness. Sensorineural deafness is damage to cochlear hair, cell, hair cells, to the auditory cortical cells. So anywhere from the ear all the way back into the brain can cause sensorineural deafness. And OSHA requires, if you have a loud uh, work environment, they require that you test your workers at the beginning of the work cycle. You provide them with hearing protection and you do routine testing on their ears to be sure you're not damaging their hearing. Okay, tinnitus is a continuous ringing in the sounds in the absence of auditory stimulation. Uh, often due to nerve, cochlear nerve degeneration, you could have inflammation in the middle or internal ears. This would be a temporary thing. Same thing, side effects of aspirin. Um, tinnitus is difficult to deal with. Uh, there are cases, there are hearing aids. Say, so if this is the pitch of sound you're hearing, let me change colors here. They actually have a sound that the, the hearing aid puts out that gives the opposite sound and it's supposed to cancel out to where what you hear is right in the middle, which is nothing. Don't know if they work, but it's a gimmick that people are selling, so it may help. Now, Meniere syndrome is uh, a labyrinth disorder of the cochlea and semicircular canals. They get vertigo or dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and ringing of the ears. Okay, balance, um, equilibrium and orientation, uh, semicircular canals in the ear are filled with fluid. Now, they're little hair-like nerve endings that sense the change in the position in the head. The vestibular apparatus consists of equilibrium receptors in semicircular canals and vestibule. The, the vestibular receptors monitor static equilibrium. Semicircular canal receptors monitor dynamic equilibrium, motion. Macula uh, is for monitoring position of head in space. And they have supporting cells and hair cells. Stereocilia and kinocilia are embedded into the otolithic membrane, which are studded with otoliths. Now, it's very much like a string. These are the hair cells and with a little rock on the end of it. Stone is what I prefer, but some people don't like that term. Okay, this is the calcium carbonate. Thousands and thousands of these little otoliths. And they detect where you are in space because actually, these are not drawn correctly. This is the bottom of the page. So Gravity is going to pull on that rock. Okay, the next page. This is showing someone standing, and you're supposed to see that when they're standing there, the uh, you don't have movement, and so the vestibular nerves are not uh, stimulated as they rotate. They're stimulated, rotate the other way. They're stimulated the other way. Now. I like to describe describe it this way. You have uh, an attachment to the nerve receptor. It's a hair cell with an otolith on the outside. And as you spin or rotate in circles, these otoliths are going to spin out. Now, this boy turned this rock, this string loose. This rock would go flying in another direction. But as it is, it's attached, so it just goes in circles. Or maybe he's rocking back and forth, but gravity will keep the motion down until this force, the centripetal force that he's putting on with his hand, overcomes gravity. So as you're spinning, the, you're going to get the fluid in your ears just rotating, and they're rotating, rotating circles. 
and these little otoliths, the sense of gravity will be overcome by this centripetal force put on by the rotation. Now, when you stop rotating, the fluid in those ears is still going. And so you're stopped, but the little rocks are still going, the otoliths. I think I mentioned in class that uh, if people have head injuries, these thousands and thousands of little hair cells here with all their little otoliths on them uh, can become entangled. And they actually have a device that they put people on to spin them in hopes of detangling their otoliths. I prefer to think that it would be more fun than to pay thousands of dollars for that treatment to go to the fair and get on that Gravitron thing and just sit back, let it spin you around. And if you're dizzy after you've been off of it a few minutes, then you could get back on it. Okay, that's about all I have for now. And thank you.